Now let me bring it back to again to what I showed yesterday. Uh, when we started in our studies, uh, first noticing in the experimental animal studies that casein, the main protein in cow's milk, that's high quality, if you will. We, as we increase casein in the diet, or animal protein in the diet, we could turn on cancer like you wouldn't believe. Almost immediately, 100% in the way it went. So then we looked at me the mechanism to account for that effect. And so what we found here, just quickly, this is a sort of representation of uh, the, the course of cancer development. Three stages. starts out initiation. That's when mutations form. And, and then we go through a period over the next, uh, let's say, months, year, whatever. And our cells are dividing, becoming cancerous, and that's called promotion. And eventually, then it metastasizes. That's called progression. But in any case, what we found when we started looking for the mechanism, how does this animal protein increase cancer? We found all these mechanisms. First, we looked here in the first stage, and here's a bunch of mechanisms here. And then we looked in the second stage. And all of them, after some 15 years or so, with my uh, graduate students, uh, he's, he's doing sort of a part of this uh, story. And I didn't know what we were, all we were doing at the time was I was looking for the mechanism to account for this animal protein effect, this harmful effect. And, and that, in theory, would lead to the possibility we could intervene with a drug if we could just make a drug and just still eat the same food. Well, in any case, I'm going over some stuff here from yesterday, but uh, we what we found is the eight mechanisms of those 10 uh, increased activity to decrease, but in, in reality, all of them, all these same mechanisms, increase cancer in unison. So I couldn't get to a point of determining which mechanism really mattered, so we could make a drug, which is not was not the point. So here I'm showing in here just a schematic representation of what I just told you. Uh, here we have a normal cell, picture a normal cell here. Here's a cancer cell. A normal cell divides into cancer cells some, sometimes. So uh, the carcinogen that uh, starts it off causing mutation, it comes into the cell, and this is and it's, that's one of those mechanisms. Animal protein increases the rate at which the carcinogen comes into the cell, and then it's subjected to a, the uh, a reaction by catalyzed by an enzyme called mixed function oxidase, uh, and and that process that enzyme actually gets rid of nasty chemicals that. Yeah, we might from time to time consume it, gets rid of them and detoxifies them, but a tiny little bit, just a, a, a far less than one tenth of one percent, uh, kind of slip out and then are reactive uh, intermediates and they bind to DNA and it damages the gene. And then that gene, if it's not repaired, we've got mechanisms to repair that kind of thing. If it's not repaired, then uh, and that cell divides, if this normal cell divides, uh, it becomes cancerous. And there's the the cancer cells with the mutated DNA. At that point in time, now we got the gene for cancer in this new cell. Uh, and then and they go through a whole series of very complex steps uh, and it eventually becomes diagnosis as cancer. And so now I want to show you those all those mechanisms I talked about yesterday to make a point. See this little star here on the left? That the animal protein increases the amount that's in the cell, and then it increases the activity of this enzyme uh, increases the synthesis of the enzyme, so more of the damaged DNA is formed, uh, but most of it is detoxified, but it's nonetheless it leads to that. And then, then the high protein that changed the characteristics, the, uh, the, the, the uh, shape of the enzyme in such a way it increases activity. These are the 10 mechanisms. And then it, uh, the high protein that increased the amount of carcinogen binding to the DNA, and then, lo and behold, as I said yesterday, the high animal protein diet blocks this really good thing. Uh, and then it does a bunch more things, as you can see. So, And then one more good thing it has, it blocks that too. So all these mechanisms are operating together. It's a really important point. They don't operate just one thing at a time, not one mechanism doing one thing. Uh, when, when a nutrient like animal protein is consumed, and other nutrients do this too, yeah. when they're consumed, they just sort of, sort of just splinter up and do their bad things if that's what we're consuming the wrong thing. So now I want to show you one other element here too that's beyond a pale in a sense. I published on this in 1980, summarizing this and there and, and basically it really has to do with the oh, testing of chemical carcinogens. 
they're testing of chemicals for partially just I'm getting feedback here on the voice, but uh, anyhow, in, in any case, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was developed a, a, a experimental animal testing procedure to determine which which chemicals in the environment could cause cancer, which ones, which ones don't. And see, this little schematic here of doing this here. Uh, we, we the, you know, the experimental animal studies, uh, the amount of the test chemical is increased up to a fairly high level, far level higher than what we humans would might get exposed to. And it's simply a, a test to see whether or not it causes cancer. And that's measured here for percent cancer. So that's the kind of study that is done, as you can see here. But there's a break in the line here in each case because uh, it would just be stretched out too far. But uh, in any case, so we, we do a study and we find out in this test chemical that, uh, lo and behold, when you give it at really high levels, it causes a response and increased cancer risk. And if those, uh, if we have three different test uh, groups, maybe four, if they kind of line up that way, then we draw a line down through to see where that comes with respect to the human. And this, this is a human exposure. So this is done very conservatively. We want to make sure that uh, when we're testing these chemicals, maybe coal tar or, or what have you, uh, we want to make sure that what we learn up here can be extrapolated down to here. And, and then there's all the calculations are done to make sure that any chemicals that we're exposed to in the environment, we call them the environmental chemicals, that any exposure we get to it, it has to be, uh, in theory, below, below a certain level, below a level that theoretically would cause one death per million people. And so that's this has been a really big deal. It's led the public to believe that we get cancer from the chemicals in our environment. It's really not true. Some of them, who are which are mutagenic, may in fact, as I showed in the previous slides, uh, go on to form uh, mutations, of course, uh, but we're talking here about levels far, far, far higher than what we ever exposed in the first place. So we know what that level is, and then we make our determinations whether such and such a chemical comes to cause cancer. You know, like the like a chemical used on uh, cranberries way back in the fifties that caused a big stir. Or apples were being sprayed with a certain chemical that turned out to be carcinogenic, according to this kind of test. Uh, so. Here we here we are, we humans are right about there. And these chemicals that are said to be carcinogenic uh, are, are uh, very potent, of course, but uh, we don't usually get exposed to enough to really cause a problem. Here is what I want to show you. This is something you've never heard before, I think. Uh, it turns out that, that our data from casein that we turned on cancer is up here. In other words, casein is far, far more carcinogenic than those chemicals. Can you imagine that? Cow's milk protein uh, or other animal-based proteins, in theory, according to this their kind of scheme, uh, are far more able to cause cancer than the chemicals we worry about in our environment. Now, I don't want to make, a, make an excuse for those, chem those chemicals in our environment. Most of them are nasty. They can do this, that, and everything else, they should, possibly in the short run. Uh, but they're not the main cause of cancer. The reason that whole conversation went that way, that those chemicals are the principal cause of cancer, is because no one wanted to talk about the possibility that food itself, something like milk, casein of milk, you know, were far more significant in terms of causing cancer than environmental chemicals that we we're being exposed to. It's really kind of an interesting sort of side case there. There are, are I get really got immersed in this myself because. Uh, we have two laboratories in the United States that uh, sort of determine this kind of thing, one run by the FDA, the other by NIH. And I visited both, I lectured to both at the time. And then there's a third one, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. It's a World Health Organization thing in Lyon, France. And I lectured there as well. So I really got up to my uh, eyeballs in, in this whole area, trying to point out that the whole, the whole program that they were telling the public you know, which chemicals cause cancer, which ones don't, is uh, kind of at, at odds with the reality. Um, so anyhow, I said enough about, about protein, I think. You know, and and I, I've really uh, come to believe that historically, no nutrient has influenced our dietary choice over time than animal-based protein. I call it the driver nutrient. 
you know, it's mostly subliminal. We don't even really, really realize we don't know what we don't know. And everybody just sort of thinks this is the justification for eating animal foods, mainly. And that is to make sure we get enough protein. It's simply false. We don't need that. It only causes problems. Uh, and people will go around and maybe and, and get to the point of questioning that uh, have had their careers destroyed in many ways. I'm one of them uh, that I unfortunately stuck to, but uh, it's been problematic to even question this kind of practice that we have in the American public. And I wanted to show here my own background. And I, I bring this up here uh, not to talk about myself, but to simply say that uh, the reason I got into this field was actually through science, as I showed yesterday. Science is done a certain way. You have to work with your biases. My biases were from the farm. That's me on a combine there, uh, and my brothers, my dad, and my mother, and, and so forth. Uh, and we were milking cows, and it was all about you know making more, more protein eventually, uh, especially when I went off to graduate school and did a thesis to show how important animal protein was. Enough said. Um, I, I, I want to now get to the point was why is it that animal protein and other nutrients too, but we did this rather thoroughly. Why is it that uh, when that nutrient, in this case, animal protein, when it's fed, it doesn't cause just one thing. It, it costs a whole, we looked at 10, probably 15, I could list there. And every time we looked for a mechanism, we found one. This was amazing because it turned out that when when they all these mechanisms are all working together, all in the same direction, no exceptions. It was pretty amazing. So I now want to bring you back to trying to elaborate on that point a little bit more. Uh, and it has to do with all the reactions that occur in our cells. Uh, this is biochemistry. And this is basically what I taught myself uh, for many years. Um, the the uh, wait, first off, let me uh, explain what I mean by this here. This is the simplest, simplest version of all. It's a million times more complicated now, but in any case, these reactions are available in all of our cells of our body. And we got like, you know, 30 some trillion cells, to be honest about it, uh, all doing their thing. Uh, so uh, in plants, in plants, these reactions all, all exist too. Plants actually capture the sun's energy. We don't, we animals, animal humans and non-humans, we, we, we don't get the energy from the sun. To, to create this series of reactions. Only plants do. So the plants are sitting there, and there's a process called photosynthesis, as you may know. The plants are there, and, and they capture the solar energy <coughs> and convert it into making chemicals. And the energy is stored in the bonds that put the atoms together and, and first forming you know, some sugars like glucose and fructose and so forth. And so... The, the plants, that their business is to capture the energy from the sun. And then we, in turn, then eat the plants to get the energy. That's the way it works. So plants have their role. Obviously, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for plants capturing the energy. So we got all of our energy from that, really. That's where we can should get it from. We don't need to eat animals because animals don't capture energy. They're, they sort of, and sort of store it in their system, of course, but Nevertheless, here's all these reactions here. And it's a very, it's very intricate. Uh, and in the beginning, way back when I was teaching biochemistry, beginning biochemistry, we were looking at one reaction at a time and getting all excited about it and so forth. Th these reactions here uh, in the top part, it's uh, referred to as glycolysis. Once these enzyme, these uh, first substrates are formed and chemicals, they store the energy there. Then those energy, those chemicals are consumed and are broken down one at a time all the way through here. And finally down here, it, what it does, the, the enzyme, the uh, chemicals kind of break down step by step by step, releasing their energy for our use. It'd be what it may, whether it's physical activity or all the millions of other things that our body needs energy for. So that's, that's a very simplistic version of it. It sounds pretty complicated, but it's really quite simple. Uh, in due course, um, uh, yes, so all these reactions then are sort of happen one at a time to give the energy to the body or cells in the various ways.